Six. On the afternoon of December 7, 2003, Daniel Morcombe left his Palmwoods home on Queensland's Sunshine Coast and set off for the Sunshine Plaza Shopping Center in Maruchador. The 13-year-old wanted to get a haircut and buy Christmas presents for his family. He never made it there. Daniel was tragically abducted and murdered. Queensland police knew who was responsible for Daniel's murder, but they just needed two things a confession, and a body. Then, on August 13, 2011, Brett Peter Cowan was arrested by police and charged with Daniel's murder. Cowan had been a suspect almost from day one, but had been essentially excluded after police concluded he had only half an hour to have committed the offense. However, the former truck driver's alibi fell apart at the inquest when his drug dealer and her partner said they couldn't recall him visiting them the afternoon of Daniel's disappearance. By the time Cowan had finished testifying, police bosses had given the green light to an undercover police operation so elaborate it could have come straight from the pages of a crime novel. On his April 2011 flight back to his new hometown of Perth, the suspect got talking to a friendly and likable young man in the next seat. He and Joe exchanged phone numbers and met several times over the next few weeks. Joe was actually an undercover police officer. Joe had some friends, Fitzy and Jeff, who portrayed themselves as members of a powerful criminal gang whose mantra was loyalty, honesty and respect. Cowan was given $150 to help Joe stake out the arrivals gate at Perth Airport for a man the crime gang was interested in. In the following months, he was involved in 23 more crime scenarios, including bribing a customs officer and trafficking weapons, illegal crayfish, and even blood diamonds from Africa. The unemployed drifter told his new friends the easy money and mateship were what dreams are made of. I found the job that I've been waiting for all these years, Cowan said, unaware the conversation was being recorded. Cowan was told he could earn $100,000 on a big job, but there was a catch. The gang had learned he would be subpoenaed for another probe into Daniel Morcombe's disappearance. In a plush Perth hotel room, the gang's big boss suggested Cowan would be dropped like a hot potato unless he confessed. The syndicate needed to know the details so they could fix any evidence Cowan may have left behind. Yeah, okay, you know, yeah, I did it, Cowan said before matter-of-factly describing how he'd lured Daniel into his car, driven him to an isolated spot, pulled his pants down, and choked him. Cowan's detailed and chilling confession was recorded on a hidden camera, and the video was played at his trial almost three years later. Cowan told them that he had spotted Daniel waiting for a bus under the Keel Mountain Road overpass. He said he parked his white Mitsubishi Pajero in a nearby church car park and walked to the bus stop where Daniel was waiting. Cowan said he offered Daniel a lift to the Sunshine Plaza shopping center, but instead drove the young teenager to an abandoned, demountable house on a macadamia farm in the Glass House Mountains. I went in the house and then came back and said to Daniel, do you want a drink before we go? He came inside and I went to pull his pants down. I panicked and I grabbed him. Cowan grabbed Daniel around the neck with the crook of his arm. Daniel allegedly died in the struggle. It was 10 to 15 minutes and I was back in the car and driving back home. Cowan said he left Daniel's body covered in branches near an old sand mine and returned about a week later with a shovel to bury Daniel. Audio recorded when Cowan showed undercover police the bushland site where he dumped Daniel's body was also used as evidence against him. The teen's remains were found almost exactly where the killers said they would be. On March 13, 2014, Brett Peter Cowan was found guilty of indecently dealing with Daniel Morcombe murdering him, and interfering with his corpse. At the trial, it was revealed Cowan was a serial pedophile and had two previous convictions for sexually abusing children. 
he was sentenced to life in prison with a 20-year non-parole period. 5. In 2017, an episode of the BBC docuseries Stacy Dooley Investigates revealed soulless Filipina mothers who eagerly advertised their own children to foreign pedophiles. Stacy, a London-born presenter, traveled to the Philippines and followed a team of local authorities and U.S. investigators deep undercover to film the episode titled, Mom Selling Their Kids for Sex. In the documentary, hidden footage revealed women trying to sell their children to Mike, an undercover agent with Homeland Security Investigations. The women, who were also sisters, held some kids as young as five years old. They assured Mike that the girls can do sex. According to Mike, the mothers were ready to perform orders of paying clients via webcam, as long as the price is right. He told Dooley, some of these guys sometimes ask for the most horrendous abuse of a child. They could ask for a child to be lit on fire, basically tortured. Some of these guys you read their online chats, they're obviously terribly sick people. They're monsters. The mothers arranged to meet with Mike at a private villa where they explained their girls can do sex before he handed over money as part of the transaction. After gathering the evidence on camera, Mike and his team proceeded to capture the women. Shockingly, the women showed no remorse, and so Stacy visited the pair in prison afterwards to see if they realized the extent of their crime. But the presenter was shocked to hear that the women pinned the blame on their children. It was the kids. They initiated it themselves, one was quoted as saying. Many youths do things they shouldn't. There are things the parents can't control, but I'm not selling them. To this, Stacy commented over the camera, A, I know that's a complete lie, and B, to have that mentality where you're supposed to be the person that protects them is just so depressing. It is such a disappointment that they just confirm that it was right to take those kids away from them too. The mothers are facing up to a life sentence for child trafficking, child abuse, and child pornography. After their arrests, the children of the two women are rehomed in the Filipino care system. 4. Senior executives at Cambridge Analytica, the data company that credits itself with Donald Trump's presidential victory, have been secretly filmed saying they could entrap politicians in compromising situations with bribes and Ukrainian sex workers. In an undercover investigation by Channel 4 News, the company's chief executive, Alexander Nix, said the British firm secretly campaigns in elections across the world. This includes operating through a web of shadowy front companies or by using subcontractors. In one exchange, when asked about digging up material on political opponents, Mr. Nix said they could send some girls around to the candidate's house, adding that Ukrainian girls are very beautiful I find that works very well. In another, he said, we'll offer a large amount of money to the candidate to finance his campaign in exchange for land, for instance. We'll have the whole thing recorded. We'll blank out the face of our guy and we'll post it on the internet. Offering bribes to public officials is an offense under both the UK Bribery Act and the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Cambridge Analytica operates in the UK and is registered in the United States. The admissions were filmed at a series of meetings at London hotels over four months, between November 2017 and January 2018. An undercover reporter for Channel 4 News posed as a fixer for a wealthy client hoping to get candidates elected in Sri Lanka. Mr. Nix told the reporter, We're used to operating through different vehicles, in the shadows, and I look forward to building a very long-term and secretive relationship with you. Along with Mr. Nix, the meetings also included Mark Turnbull, the managing director of CA Political Globe, and the company's chief data officer, Dr. Alex Taylor. Mr. Turnbull described how, having obtained damaging material on opponents, Cambridge Analytica can discreetly push it into social media and the internet. He said, 
we just put information into the bloodstream of the internet. And then, watch it grow. Give it a little push every now and then, like a remote control. It has to happen without anyone thinking, that's propaganda. Because the moment you think, that's propaganda, the next question is, who put that out? Mr. Nix also said, Many of our clients don't want to be seen to be working with a foreign company. So we often set up, if we are working, then we can set up fake IDs and websites. We can be students doing research projects attached to a university. We can be tourists. There's so many options we can look at. I have lots of experience in this. In the meetings, the executives boasted that Cambridge Analytica and its parent company, Strategic Communications Laboratories, SCL, had worked in more than 200 elections across the world, including Nigeria, Kenya, the Czech Republic, India, and Argentina. The company is at the center of a scandal over its role in the harvesting of more than 50 million Facebook profiles. Chief Executive Mr. Nix has also been accused of misleading a parliamentary select committee, which is now asking him to provide further information. He has denied the allegations. In March 2018, Cambridge Analytica spokesman said, We entirely refute any allegation that Cambridge Analytica or any of its affiliates used entrapment, bribes, or so-called honey traps for any purpose whatsoever. We routinely undertake conversations with prospective clients to try to tease out any unethical or illegal intentions. They said, Cambridge Analytica does not use untrue material for any purpose. And they insisted that opposition research and intelligence gathering, the use of subcontractors, and working discreetly with clients are all common practice and legitimate. 3. In 2015, an anti-abortion organization named the Center for Medical Progress CMP released several videos that had been secretly recorded. Members of the CMP posed as representatives of a biotechnology company in order to gain access to both meetings with abortion providers and abortion facilities. The video showed how abortion providers made fetal tissue available to researchers, although no problems were found with the legality of the process. All of the videos were found to be altered according to analysis by Fusion GPS and its co-founder, Glenn R. Simpson, a former investigative reporter for the Wall Street Journal. The videos were made over a period of 30 months and were released approximately once per week to increase exposure, including media coverage, and to allow the public more time to consume and react to each video. The first video released by CMP happened over lunch at a Los Angeles restaurant. Two anti-abortion activists posing as employees from a biotech firm met with Deborah Nukatola, Planned Parenthood's Senior Director of Medical Research. Armed with cameras, the activists recorded Nukatola talking about Planned Parenthood's work with donating fetal tissue to researchers and pressed her on whether the clinics were charging for the organs. The video shows Nukatola describing in graphic detail how abortionists are able to harvest organs from aborted babies based on the parts that are needed. To which one of the fake buyers replied, yeah, a dime a dozen. She went on to describe how they are able to require other organs without crushing them. The video attracted widespread media coverage, and after the release of the first video, conservative congressional lawmakers singled out Planned Parenthood and began to push bills that would strip the organization of federal family planning funding. CMP says the footage proves that Planned Parenthood is breaking the law by selling fetal organs, but the video does not show Nukatola explicitly talking about selling organs. The Planned Parenthood official says the organization is very sensitive about being perceived as illegally profiting from organ sales and charges only for the cost, for instance, of shipping the tissue. In a statement, a spokesman for Planned Parenthood said the video misrepresents the organization's work. Planned Parenthood clinics, with a patient's permission, may sometimes donate fetal tissue for use in stem cell research, said the spokesman, who added that the group's affiliates, which operate independently, do not profit from these donations. 
Officials in 12 states initiated investigations into claims made by the videos, but none found Planned Parenthood clinics to have sold tissue for profit as alleged by CMP and other anti-abortion groups. On March 28, 2017, CMP founder David Deleden and member Sandra Merritt were charged with 15 felonies in the state of California, one for each of the people whom they had filmed without consent and one for criminal conspiracy to invade privacy. The editorial board of the New York Times described CMP's actions as a campaign of deception against Planned Parenthood and wrote that the video campaign is a dishonest attempt to make legal, voluntary, and potentially life-saving tissue donations appear nefarious and illegal. 2. In mid-2014, a video surfaced in Chinese media showing appalling practices in a Shanghai food processing factory that supplies ingredients to many international restaurant brands. A reporter from a Shanghai broadcaster secretly filmed inside the food processing plant of Shanghai Husi Food, a subsidiary of US-based food supply giant OSI Group. The footage captured workers handling food with their bare hands. Several scenes showed them picking up meat that had fallen on the floor and returning it directly into the processing machine. One worker, his face concealed behind a surgical mask, turned to the camera and stated, foul meat, referring to the meat being handled. Shanghai Municipal Food and Drug Administration, FDA, subsequently investigated the factory and found that expired beef and chicken products were processed and repackaged with new expiration dates. In some cases, the meat was reportedly up to a year past its expiry date. Amongst the tainted products, they were able to trace forged production dates on more than 4,300 cases of smoked beef patties, with more than 3,000 cases already sold. Hoosie had been supplying chicken and beef products to branches of McDonald's, Papa John's, Burger King, Starbucks, KFC, and Pizza Hut in several cities in China. Since the scandal broke, all brands have cut ties with Hoosie's parent company, OSI Group, except for McDonald's. Although no one has fallen sick as a direct result of the tainted meat supply, Shanghai's FDA has closed the Hoosie plant at the center of the scandal and detained five employees for questioning. Meanwhile, Shanghai's top official has pledged to met out severe punishment for anyone involved in the incident. One. An elderly Catholic priest, apparently in an Italian hospital, was caught in an undercover video laughing and joking about his own sexual assault of boys, along with assaults of other priests at a diocesan home for deaf-mute children. The 2017 video shows Italian father Elagio Piccoli recounting unapologetically, almost boastfully, how he abused boys. I lost my head and grabbed him from behind, he said. With gestures, Piccoli simulated sodomitic acts that priests and other religious allegedly committed with minors. In one instance, Piccoli pointed to the undercover journalist as if to humor him about homosexual rape. By touching it, the male organ becomes hard, you know. Damn it, come on, he jokingly told the undercover journalist. Now an invalid, Piccoli laughed as he recounted the names of several priests and religious who allegedly fondled or raped minors at the Provolo Institute for Deaf-Mute Children in Verona, Italy. Piccoli is one of several priests and staff of Provolo Institute in Italy, which was operated by members of the Community of Mary religious congregation. With those kids, Piccoli tells the hidden camera while wearing a rosary around his neck, the only joke I did was to touch one, even though I shouldn't have done so. The video was recorded by a journalist for fanpage.it, an Italian website. It was a young one who came to my room. He was cuddly. While the rest of the children were playing, he wasn't. It was cold, so I said, come into my room, Piccoli said to the journalist, who claimed to be a former student while asking about accusations of sex abuse by priests. At a certain moment, Piccoli said, he showed me his male member. Some of what they say is true, but all of them are corrupt. They touch each other. They masturbate. 
In the video, Pacoli said at least 10 priests abused children at the Provolo Institute. When they were found out, he said, they were transferred. It wasn't a sin, Pacoli said in the candid video, adding, doing among males was a joke, but to do it with a woman is more serious. If one does it out of necessity, to make a joke is nothing. It's like having the vice of smoking. Several of the victims have given accounts of experiencing and witnessing abuse while they were at the Provolo Institute in Italy. In 2009, 67 former students of the Provolo Institute accused priests, nuns, and consecrated laity of sexual abuse of children under their care during a period extending from the 1960s to the 1980s. The fan page IT video was uploaded in February 2017 and has circulated widely. Piccoli is now more than 85 years old and was receiving care in December 2017 at a residence for elderly priests at Negrar, a town approximately 10 miles from Verona in northern Italy. According to the Argentine newspaper Clarin, Piccoli was later moved from Negrar to an undisclosed location where he is protected by